The Pint of Science, brought to you by the Faculty of Science, Charles University in Prague, Department of Chemistry, sponsored by the Pilsner Brewery. A little bit merry, so do forgive me or I get a bit excited, because I tend to get a bit excited when I talk about my beloved boron hydrides and the work that I'm doing with them. And it's my pleasure to be able to have the, the short time available to me to tell you a bit about what I'm doing at the moment with these particular compounds. So, my name is Adi Michael, and I work at the Institute of Innovative Chemistry. Uh, it's in the Rzeszu Prahi, so about 12 kilometers north up the river from here. Here's a picture from the bridge, uh, from where the train stops, which looks onto Rzesz. And uh, I rather like this picture because it's rather mysterious and it sort of has an atmosphere of, of uh, I don't know, something mysterious and strange. And indeed, the history of our institute is such. The institute is tucked away in this little meander on the Vltava River for a purpose, because it was built during the, the Cold War. And it was built to house top secret uh, research work. And that is where the where Czechoslovakia at the time, today's Czech Republic, started being one of the main motor engines for the development of boron hydride chemistry. Enveloped in this mystery of top secret research, there were spies involved and there was a lot of rocket fuels involved. Hello, Peter. Gentlemen, come in quickly and take your seat. Make things <laughs> pause while they like. grab a beer, maybe. <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so Zesh Kuprahi, that's where the institute is. As I said, top secret research, spies involved. Indeed, it's such an exciting thing that we made a, a, little, a, little, vil, a little film about this story of secret agents that were coming to Prague uh, to discover the progress or to find out what the progress really was with these Czechoslovakian scientists on. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. These Czechoslovakian scientists who were wanting to who were wanting to develop these uh, uh, this particular brand of chemistry. There's the classic green boring flame that you see because when you burn the boron, when you oxidize the boron hydrides, they release a lot of energy and a green flame. There's my lab. Here's some of the people I work with. So of course, the Russians were interested in developing rockets that could they could fire off the, from the Murski region and hit uh, America 7,000 kilometers away. During this top secret area region, there was a lot of unexpected uh, discoveries made in Czechoslovakia. Indeed, one which is relevant to uh, Peter Siegler and this gentleman here with the use of these compounds for vitamin A. Oh, okay, and that's the end. No. So, really what I want to try and say is something is what I'm Boron hydride chemistry is an extremely exciting chemistry because it was only, the boron hydrides exist on our planet only a, a hundred or so years. The, the discovery was made in 1912. Since that time, there was a, a top secret period of, of research work where the Czechoslovakian chemists were working unfortunately for the Russian uh, army, essentially, for developing rocket fuels. Since then, it's gone on to making all sorts of high-tech use of these compounds, uh, of which I'd like to take, briefly mention some aspects. But before we go into the boron hydride chemistry, I want to take a step back and remind you about chemistry as a whole on our planet. Because for me, as a chemist, if you want to really simplify it, it's really about the triangle of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Our uh, surface chemistry on this planet is dominated by these three atoms, these three, these three elements. 
And of course, as we live in an oxidizing uh, planet with a 20% odd of oxygen in our atmosphere, the thermodynamic stability is always tending towards oxides of carbon, carbon dioxide or these uh, carbonates. And indeed, that's the case in our next door neighbors, Venus and Mars, where it's also all about carbon dioxide. However, our planet is unique in the sense that it can convert carbon dioxide, reduce it and form hydrocarbons. And here are some of the hydrocarbons. Indeed, this young lady here is, an entire, is herself a hydrocarbon, including her nylon stockings, including her PVC dress. <laughs> Maybe there's some silicon there, but essentially it's a hydrocarbon. <laughs> so, carbon with oxygen, carbon with hydrogen. Carbon with oxygen, carbon with hydrogen. You begin to see the, the, the principle here. Right? When you take out oxygen and put in hydrogen, what you're essentially doing is you're putting into the mo molecules chemical potential. And once a molecule has got chemical potential, it can do, it has the capacity to do chemistry. It can start from its energetic top and then you can do some chemistry and you can, you can isolate certain thermodynamically stable products. And they're interesting. And a lot of you here in this, in this uh, department are doing organic chemistry with such molecules. Now, we have a process on this planet which gives that, that chemical potential, and that's photosynthesis. It's unique to carbon. And as an undergraduate, or a, a student your ages, I was reading through, I don't know, books like the, the Chemistry of the Elements, I was rather depressed by the limitations of all this marvellous chemistry on the element of carbon. But it's not limited to just carbon. It's also available to boron, and it's thanks to this gentleman here, who is one of my heroes, his name is Alfred Stock, who is a German chemist who in 1912 made the first boron hydrides. And here's what they look like. Now, if we compare them to the rather boring and tedious hydrocarbons, which are essentially made of two-dimensional chains and sheets, the boron hydrides form these wonderfully beautiful, aesthetically pleasing uh, polyhedra. And these polyhedra not only look good, but they also have fantastic properties. Don't forget, in chemistry, uh, properties are usually a function of structure. And so here we have the reason why they form these three-dimensional um, polyhedra is because boron, unlike carbon, is not electron precise. So whereas carbon has four bonding orbitals and four bonding valence electrons, boron has the same number of orbitals, but only three electrons. Thus, its chemistry is all about trying to get electron density. And it does that by clustering around itself. The same way as if you go deep sea diving as a, as a group, you could survive with only, if there was 10 of you diving with six oxygen tanks, if you clustered around and share the gas, okay? Well, Boron is the same with its electron density. So inside these clusters, these are no longer two center, two electron, normal hydrocarbon type ones. These are uh, three center, two electron um, delocalized systems. You have a, a pseudo um, aromatic uh, base where the electron density is shared within this cluster. Okay? And this, this delocalization, this um, aromaticity, gives a lot of interesting properties which I'm interested in developing. Okay, so uh, to briefly recap on what I've just said, Alfred Stock, 1912. There was no boron hydrides before that. Okay? Then you've got this amazing period of top secret research around the Cold War period, which start, you know, which really the, the Czechoslovakian group did a lot of work towards. And indeed, it was the Czechoslovakian scientists who then, after it became declassified, organized the first international conferences in this area and became extremely important and an influential group globally regarding this chemistry. Since those days, we're going far more high tech. The thought of burning boron hydride beautiful clusters just for its energy is repellent, is repellent for me. Okay? I want to use these clusters to do some really good chemistry. It happens here that there's people who, 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 who work with us. Here, this, in fact, this is a particular element of Peter Siegler. Here you can see this is the use of these compounds to try and block the functioning of uh, an HIV protease. Uh, so there's a medicinal potential, there's potential and uses in the, uh, this is the extraction of radionuclides, um, they're using our clusters which are extremely stable, I did a lot of work in microelectronics, cancer possibilities, and of course the latest type of laser, which I'd like to tell you more about in a bit. 
Okay, time is short. I'm going to concentrate on my favorite boron hydride molecule. I love boron hydride molecules, but of all of them, my favorite is this beauty here, anti B18 H22. It's called a macropolyhedral. That means we're fusing individual clusters together. They're sharing boron vertices, and they have this amazing quasi-aromatic molecular orbital system. It's a beautiful cluster. And I was working for a number of years on the use of this cluster in, in, the, in the fabrication of semiconductors to dope boron into silicon. Okay? And indeed, when I first came to the Czech Republic, I was half here, half in America, developing these things. Okay, after which I became disinterested in this and I became interested in the following. So, is this video going to work? Work. Here we go. Okay, so I was working on the use of B18H22 with a company in uh, semiconductors. To be frank, it was boring work, and, uh, but lucrative. After finishing that, I had to leave the whole uh, area because of intellectual property things, considerations, I began to develop a new thing regarding the same BATH32 molecule. A very rare aspect of, of, of boron hydrogen chemistry. It is highly fluorescent. I want to go inside one of these solutions. Here we go. Here's our BAT molecules. Okay? Our BAT molecules are amazing because they're unique amongst the boron hydrides in that they can fluoresce. Okay, so they can absorb electromagnetic oscillations of a certain frequency and then afterwards they emit visible light. And I became interested in looking at this property and trying to understand it as much as possible. So we've got peak absorption of about 330 nanometers and a beautiful and, and rather, uh, rather unusual 406 purple blue, purple blue uh, emission. This is the first fluorescent binary boron hydride and it very importantly has a quantum yield of fluorescence of almost, almost one. So this molecule is incredibly efficient at its fluorescence and the high efficiency of this fluorescence allows us to uh, use this capacity to make things such as the first boron hydride laser material. Which is a part of what I'm trying to do in unlocking the potential of the boron hydrides. Okay, a bit of, just a few details. Um, the quantum yield is an important aspect. Here, here is a diagram which really shows you uh, the simplicity of the system. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a single electron, uh, a single electron event. Here we have the ground state of, I don't know, how's your photophysics? <laughs> Are you up to date? Do, how, do, do, would you recognize such a diagram? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So, right, we've got our ground state. This is a, a, single, a single electron excitation. Uh, and then here is the important bit here. This is the excited state, the S1 excited state. This is called the conical intersection point through which the molecule can just wobble off its energy non radiatively and relax back down. Importantly, there's a more than a half electron uh, volt, um, electron volt barrier from the S1 minimum to this point. In which case, the excited, electric, the excited molecule remains excited for a long time. And I mean a long time. 12.1 nanoseconds, which for a molecule is almost an eternity. Okay? This baby, once it's excited, stays excited for a long time. Now, when this molecule is excited, it can do lots of things. Okay? It can do lots of things. Fortunately for us, B18H22 anti likes to fluoresce. And I'm talking about loves to for us, 97, 97%. Okay? So 97% of photons that it absorbs, it ends up into, 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 into a beautiful blue fluorescence. So we published this, this is the first study in, in 2012. Uh, last year we published um, uh, uh, another article looking at its laser properties. Because of this really high quantum yield of fluorescence, it becomes, it, it, it offers itself as a, as a useful for a laser material. Now, not many molecules necessarily can work as a laser material because you're hitting them, you're exciting them with a lot of energy, okay, to, to gain that laser uh, 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 fluorescent emission. This molecule sticks together, holds together, withstands that, these heavy duty pumping conditions and gives off a wonderfully, nicely coherent uh, blue purple 407 nanometer laser light. Uh, the laser efficiency is 10%. Now, 
That might sound pretty low, considering it's almost 100% efficient in fluorescence. Nevertheless, the first laser dyes, organic laser dyes, were about 3 to 4% efficient. And compare this to the, to the market, the, uh, the market blue laser uh, from the organic, um, organic dyes, that's about 30% efficient. So our efficiency is not brilliant, but it's not bad. What is fantastic is what's called the, the photostability of our system. This molecule is able to outperform its market competitors in terms of its photostability. That means how many times you can pump it with energy to get a, a, a mission out of it before the molecule inevitably falls apart. And it's, it's up there as, as the best amongst we compare it with all sorts of nanodots, anything from the blue, commercially blue laser dots, um, or organic dyes, etc. This means that we have a new cowboy that's come to town. Okay. Whereas, whereas we're used to seeing uh, organic dyes, quantum dots in the, the blue blazing uh, in the blue blazing town, the has come to town, and that's really exciting. So, if you look at the different families of laser materials, what is outstanding about B eighteen H twenty two is it doesn't fit into any of them. It doesn't fit into any of them. This is the first molecule of a new family. It's not an organic dye, it's, it's, got, not, it's, got, not, it's got not even one atom of carbon. Forget organic. Okay? It's, it's not a quantum dot blatantly. It's almost like the first inorganic molecular dye. Okay? So, it's really exciting from that aspect. Now, as always, there's always a heart check. And uh, in our case here, the, the, the Achilles heel of, of BATH22 is its low absorption coefficient. That's the reason why its efficiency goes down. Here's a comparison, this is the molar extinction coefficient, this is the efficiency of absorption of B18 compared to this is the, the market leader uh, for blue uh, organic laser dyes. So we have a compound, which is the first of its kind in terms of laser materials. A compound that has a, a decent laser efficiency, a compound that has an outstanding photostability, which means you can use it for a long time, its Achilles heel, however, is that it doesn't absorb particularly efficiently. So the photons it does absorb, it very efficiently converts to light, the blue light. But it takes, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's like I can imagine it's somebody who needs a lot of drink before it starts dancing on the dance floor. <laughs> so it's not like straight away, it doesn't get excited straight away. It needs a few drinks, it needs a lot of, it needs a bit of foreplay, and then it gets going. When it gets going, it's good. <laughs> so my... My current goal in chemistry is to work out to how to unlock, how to, how to ease B18 into, into easy, easy excitation. Okay? So we're looking at all sorts of, all sorts of things. I'm, but I haven't got time, too much time to talk about those uh, in too much detail. But what I'll tell you is some new results. Here's, here's one of our new little beauties that we're playing around with. You see, it's B18 with these uh, organic, uh, organic glitters to it. It's a wonderful molecule. Um, this is coming out now, punishing you now in advanced optical materials. Um, here they are. So it's like B18, but it's got these, it's got these pyridine ligands. Okay? And these pyridine, in, in solution, these pyridine ligands can, can like flap around and, and circle around. And of course, as you slow this rotation around, whether it be through you know, cooling it down, for example, you alter the photophysics. So what we found out, actually, is that as, you, as we vary the angle of rotation, and we look at the molecular uh, coefficient of absorption, it has a huge influence. The, the, the relative angle of the pyridine ligands to the boron cluster has a huge influence on the efficiency of absorption. It, it sort of oscillates up and down, up and down as it turns around. Now, if we can freeze this out, okay, by cooling it right down, or indeed if we put it in, if we have it in a solid state, it pumps up. We can, we, here, here's, a, here's an x-ray structure, look at these ligands, okay, they're frozen out, as it happens, just at the right angle, and that really boosts up its, its, uh, its uh, photophysics. Also, it's interesting, we can, we can control this relative molecular slip of these two molecules of the dimer, which reduces pi pi interactions and also boosts quantum yield. So it's really cool, read about it, it's coming out now. Uh, another really nice thing, down to luck, look at this. Here, this is if we, if we, we can also freeze this rotation by dissolving it in polystyrene and making thin films, like here. This is a thin film, polystyrene film, 
of this, of this compound. What's interesting is that its absorption, here's the, here's the black band here is the absorption, the absorption overlaps the emission of B18, H22, the blue one. Okay. That means that we can, we can combine the two together. We can combine the two together, okay, the two materials in polystyrene, this is the result. It's a, an energy transfer where we can, we can excite with UV, the B18, H22 gets excited, uh, uh, releases blue light, that blue light is then uh, encapsulated, absorbed, and it comes out as uh, an orange-red fluorescence. And this is called a threat mechanism, which is, in our case, very, very, uh, is 93% efficient and affected over 37 nanoscopes. Which means we're using this thing now to get to, essentially what we're doing is we're funneling light. We're catching light over, over a, 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 quite a, a 350, 400 nanometer stretch and funneling it into one wavelength, which has all sorts of, of course, potential uses. One last thing, we can rip this molecule apart, keep the pyridines there, this molecule we call Mickey Mouse, by the way. <laughs> and Mickey Mouse is really cool. Right, Mickey Mouse, uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, also absorbs, uh, uh, absorbs UV radiation, mainly based on the cluster, and then pushes that energy out towards its pyridine rings, from which we get uh, fluorescence. Okay. Now, um, this system is also thermochromic, okay, so we cool it down, right, the, the, uh, the quantum yield goes up a lot, the intensity goes up a lot, which is unusual. In many organic systems, it's the other way around, so it's like an opposite effect. Now, um, we can play around with the chemistry, of course. This is, this is Punk Mickey. Are we call him Punk Mickey. He looks like this. So it's like Mickey Mouse, but he's got a few earrings. And this, 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 this compound in particular, because of the, these uh, methyl groups here, pulling the electron density towards it. So when you've got an in-out system, absorption into this part here, pulls out to, to the rings, we increase the, uh, we increase the efficiency. And we're working with some people now in Zaline. I'm going to go through it quickly because it's pretty top secret. And we're, we're actually got <laughs> this, he's it, that's the first borane LED. First borane LED. Well, that was the first, that's that getting a bit better. This, this is our latest results. Okay. So, you have to have the room, you have to turn all the lights off, but, you, but we can see it. And that's made me really happy that we can not only get boron laser lights, but also uh, effective LEDs. So, that was my boron story. Thank you.